Hey there, this is Math 8, Unit 6, Lesson 1, Organizing Data. All right, so here we go. We're going to be taking a look at some data in this unit. I'll do my best to get through this as quickly as you guys are getting to it. So here we go. It says here's a table of data. Each row shows two measurements of a triangle. And so we have the short side of the triangle listed over here in this column. And here we have the length of the perimeter. Okay, so we have a triangle, right? And a triangle is going to have, as we know, three sides. And it has a short side that's given to us as 0.25. I don't know which one it's going to be. And we have a length of the perimeter, which is like the distance around the whole thing, which shows the, com the, the combination you get when you add up all three sides to be, in this case here, one. So what are some things that you notice or that you wonder about when you look at this table right here? Okay. So some things you might think about is, okay, if this is the short side, then what would be the length for the the um, the long sides right is the short the short sides are like, like is each side different do you have a short side a medium side and a long side I'm not really sure so there's different ways of kind of approaching or thinking about this that you need to kind of take into consideration here and you can see that you have the data is not in any particular order right that's one thing I notice here you have a one you have a two, a three, and here's four. So it's all scattered, and I'm not really sure why that is. Um, but so there's lots of things that come up that I'm not really sure about, things that I wonder about um, that you might wonder about as well. I'm kind of delaying here because I'm working in a different room today, and my projector's not on, so I don't know what you can see on your screens. Okay, so I'm going to turn the page and hope we can get this on your screen. Hopefully you're seeing it still. Uh, okay, we'll find out. So here's a table of isosceles right triangle measurements from the warm-up and an empty table. So the same numbers here and an empty table right there. Now an isosceles right triangle, isosceles means that it's going to have two sides that are the same. And a right triangle means I'm going to have an angle that's a 90 degrees. So typically what that means is that you have a triangle that looks like this. So these two lines end up being the same. And then you have this longer line that goes across. Typically, it's longer there, um, but it but it may not be. It's hard to really say for sure. It could be that the short side is this side here, and this is longer depending on what's going on there. Okay. First thing I want you to do is it says to how it says how number one how can you organize the measurements from the first table so that any patterns are easier to see. Okay. So how can you organize it, and then write the organized measurements in the table. So one of the things we noticed when we did the notice and wonder bit was that when you're working with this set of data here, everything is all scattered and out of order. It would make the most sense to put these in numerical order, starting with the smallest and working down to the largest. So if I do that, my smallest value is 0.25 and the length is 1. So I can check that one off because I got that one done there. And then we kind of go through the other ones. We have 0.5 here and 2. We have 1 and 2.5 and so you can fill these in on your chart as well and if I'm going too fast then just pause and, and check back in and make sure you did it right Oop, I did 1.5 well that'll help you you can catch up because I messed up that's okay so here we go 1.25 sorry about that and 3.5 followed by 1.5 and 5 and then we go to 2 which is here and 7.5 we go to 3, which is here, and 9.5. And then we go to a 3.5 and 12.5. And then a 4, which is going to go with the 14. And then finally our 6.5, which goes with 22. So here we have the data organized smallest to largest to help us see if there's any sort of pattern that happens or any kind of relationship between the short side and the length of the perimeter there. The next thing it says, for each of the following lengths, estimate the perimeter of an isosceles right triangle whose short sides have that length. And so for A, they have us looking at 0.75, just because I don't want to turn the page too much. B, it has us looking at one that is uh, 5 centimeters, and C has us looking at one that is 10 centimeters. So let's take a look at each of these three measurements here. So what do we know? So for the 0.75 measurement, we know that comes between right here between 0.5 and 1. So a good estimate would be something that happens right in between 2 and 2.5. 2 
So a good estimate to the perimeter, I would say for this first one, might be something like 2.25. When we look at part B, we see that we're looking at five centimeters. Well, that's gonna be larger than four, but less than 6.5. Now the difference between these two right here is I think I can count up right from 14 to 22 is about eight, but it's not like five is right in the middle. So I can't just add four or subtract four. I probably need to kind of go more like three and five, make the difference there between three and five, because I'm talking about a difference of eight, and it's a little more towards this side. So if I add about three, so 14 plus three is about 17, that might be a good estimate for what that perimeter is gonna be. They should all be in centimeters there. Now in terms of the 10, well, it's again hard to say exactly what's happening. You know, if I look at how do you go from one to 2.5, I can think about it's multiplying by about 2.5. On the two, to go from two to 7.5, um, well, I'm multiplying by at least three, but more than three, almost four, maybe about three and a half to get from two to 7.5. To go from three to 9.5, that's about a little more than three. And to go from four to 14, it's a little more than three. So I'm always multiplying by a little more than three, except for that first one. So to estimate again, I would multiply 10 by probably again a little more than three. And so you could probably estimate anywhere between 30 and 35 centimeters would probably be a safe estimate for that problem right there. Let's take a look real quick at the are you ready for more because it's a different type of uh, way of displaying data for you to take a look at and let's just see what it wants you to do. It says in addition to the graphic representations of the data you le have learned, there are other others that make sense in other situations. Examine the map showing the results of the elections for the United States president in 2012 and 2016. The red are states where the majority of the electorate votes, electorate votes were cast for the Republican, so red Republican, and blue were the Democrat. Now these are electric votes. So what information can you see in these maps that would be more difficult to see in a bar graph showing the number of electric votes for the two main candidates? So what are some things that are easy to see because of this kind of picture way of showing the graphic representation of the electorate votes? A couple of things you might notice right away is we see a lot of blue over here in the northeast during both times. So we can tell that a lot of there were a lot of uh, Democrat uh, votes for the Democratic presidential candidate in the northeast there, as well as in the west out here in this area. So where I'm at over here in California, California almost always votes for the Democrat in the election. So if I choose to vote for someone not a Democrat, then I get outvoted by the Democrats in California and their vote goes to electing our president. Now, if you happen to live more in the kind of central part of, 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 of the United States here, we have a lot more Republicans in the middle and Republicans down here towards the southern portion as well. So it helps us see where are the Democratic pop, uh, pockets of voting happening, where are the Republican pockets happening there. Now, why is it appropriate for the data that's shown here? The reason this is a great map to show you this is because when you're talking about electorate votes, you're talking about the Electoral College, and each state just puts their vote in for one of the parties, which everyone has the majority of the votes from that uh, state. So it helps you see visually in the United States which states vote primarily Republican or which votes vote primarily Democrat. Um, and so that's why that's a good picture to help you see what's going on. So if I'm a Republican candidate, I know I'm probably gonna get some good votes from this area pretty consistently. I know that Texas and Mississippi, Alabama are probably gonna vote for me no matter what. So if I wanted to make sure I wanted to increase the number of people that voted for me, like you can see here, look at Florida. Florida was a Democrat in the 2012, but became a 2016 Republican. So those votes went from, from the Democrat to the Republican side right there. That was a change. Same for changes that happened here too. So you can see the presidential candidate must have done a good job of convincing more Republicans to vote for him than previously. So it's just things you could notice and look at there. Let's look at activity number three. Activity three, which is called tables and their scatter plots, which is right here. It says here are four scatter plots. Your teacher, your teacher, is going to give you some papers. Um, it's going to give you some four data tables. They look like this. Data tables like these ones here. Use the information in the tables to label the axes for each scatter plot. 
So we have some numbers on the y and the x axis of each of these plots here. You can see in this case we have 21,000 or 6 to 21,000 there. We have 0 to 150,000 here. Here we go 2,000 to 10,000 and then little numbers 0 to 2 and then you can just see the difference in numbers. So when you look at the different tables we want to see all right what kind of numbers are we talking about? When I look at the new car table I see we're talking about numbers generally in the 1,000 to 2,000 range and then on this side here I can see kind of 16 being a low number up to 28 or actually 30. So 16 to 30 and then some things in the thousands. So what do I have that has thousands and something in the you know 16 to 30 range? I would say this one right here looks like the best because I can see thousands down here and over there as well. So the number here that goes in the bottom part, this is going to be related to in this case here, this will be our mass down here in kilograms and this over here becomes our fuel efficiency. And we could take a look at the table and see well is this an accurate kind of reading. So you could you kind of plot a point here. We can say well can I find this anywhere on the table? Can I find a value about 1250 and then 30 miles per gallon? Well, if you look over here, what do you see? When I have a fuel efficiency of 30 miles per gallon, I'm about 1234. So this point matches that one right there. That's what we're talking about, is finding that point using a table. So the table data here can be put into this scatter plot. And that works great when you have two different things you're comparing. I'm comparing a mass to a fuel efficiency, and I can use a table to show that, but I can also do this. But visually this is helpful because it shows me that, gosh, I have greater fuel efficiency when the vehicle is lighter compared to when the vehicle is more heavy. When the vehicle is heavier, the fuel efficiency becomes less. Right? When the vehicle is light, I get 30 miles per gallon. When the vehicle weighs a lot more, I'm getting 16 miles per gallon. So if I have a big old truck, it's going to not get good fuel mileage. But if I have a light little car, I might get better fuel mileage. So this scatter plot shows that very well. Let's take a look at the other one. We have daily highs and we have energy consumed. Now in this case here, our highs are generally going to be, it looks like, from 70 to 100. So we're looking for 70 to 100 in one category. And then for the energy, we're looking at things in like the 20s to 40s. So I'm looking for 70 to 100 and then 20 to 40. Well, where do I see that? Well, when I look here, I have 70 to 100 and 20 to 40, this looks like the table that I want. So let's put the numbers in. The numbers that go to 100 are our daily high, and the numbers that go over here is our energy consumed. Okay, so that makes the most sense for that right there. Let's take a look at another one. We have a couple more tables here to take a look at. So we have used cars, 20 used cars. We have prices in dollars and the mileage. So the mileage here goes from, I see a 2,000 low, and that 2,000 goes to about 16,000. Let's just look for that. Do you see a 2,000 number anywhere? Here's a 2,000 number, but these numbers here are decimals. That's not going to quite work out. Now over here, I don't have a, I have a 2,000 maybe on this side. And that 2,000 we said went to 15, 16,000. That looks like about what I'm talking about. So this one doesn't have the two kind of number ranges I want, 2,000 to 100, and this over here about the teen thousands, right? This one certainly does. So I would say that in this case here, we're going to put this as our mileage there, and this becomes our price. So you can see that in this case here, the lower the mileage, the higher the price. But as mileage increases, what happens to our price? The price seems to decrease, which is great to see when you use that scatter plot to do that. Which means our last one is going to go with this one here. And we can see that we have the weight of a diamond from 1, 1.5, 2.04. This will be our weight down here because of the numbers that are available here in X. And our price goes there. So again, what we can learn is the higher, the greater the weight, the higher the price, right? Price tends to go up as the weight of the diamond also increases.
So that's what you can see with that scatter plot. Pretty nice to look at and kind of cool things to learn about. Okay, so let's take a look at our summary and then we'll move into our homework. So summary says, Consider the data collected from pulling back a toy car, then letting it go forward. In the first table, the data may not seem to have an obvious pattern, because it's all messed up, right? The second table has the same data shown, so the values, both values are increasing together. So there's a value in organizing your table. If you organize it, you can start to see that every time it's pulled back more, the travel distance increases, increases, increases. And you can start to kind of make a point for that. So a table shows you that, but another way of showing it is also in a scatter plot. If you take this same information and you put it in a scatter plot, we can do the pullback distance of one inch, and we can see that it's about nine right there. And if we plot all those points, you can start to see what we call a trend or a trend line. We can see that this has a tendency of going up. The further you pull it back, the farther it tends to go. All right, and so sometimes you can observe a pattern and make some predictions if you make a scatter plot like this. So you can take a table, turn in the scatter plot, and you're good to go. Let's pause right there and let you do your homework, and we'll come back and check that together in just a couple minutes. Okay, homework time. Here's data on the number of cases of whooping cough from 1939 to 1955. It says make a new table that orders the data by year. So what you need to do here is we need to organize the data by year. Okay, so if you make a mistake along the way, just erase and move forward. So the, the first year we can see is 1939, and that data is 103,188. You'll probably want to write this on a different piece of paper. It's up to you how you want to do that. Then we can see we have 1940 over here, and I put 1940 next, and this number 183,866. We got 1941, and we have 222,202. I look for 1942, there it is, 1942, and we have 191,383. So we can see that there's not really a huge pattern. We're going up, up, and then down a little bit, but we're definitely increasing. 1943, we have over here, we have 190, oops, 191, 890. 1944, little decrease, 109,873. 1945, is that there? There it is, 1945. We have 133,792. 1946, 1946, we have 109,860. 1947, down the bottom down here. 1947, we have 156,517. And then let's see, 48, 1948, we have 74,715. Like, I'm gonna make a little note there because that's a significant change, isn't it? Here we've been in the 100,000s, and we go up and down and there, and then suddenly 74,000, like we drop below. Well, is that gonna continue? Let's see. 1949, what happens in 1949? We have 69,479. Okay, so we're decreasing even more. 1950. Uh oh, 120,718. That's not good. Back up high again. Oh well. 51. We have 51. Here's 51. 1951. 68,687. Back to low. All right. And I should have more room, but I don't. 1952. We have 45,030. In 53, we have 37,129. And in 54. We have 60,866 and 54, so I got 53, 51, 52, and 55, we have 62,786. All right, so definitely a decrease starting at about 1948, except for that one year in 1950. That's a little strange, but there it is. So the question, the next question is, which years in this period of time had fewer than 100,000 cases of whooping cough? So you look back here and we could say, by looking at the organization, here's pretty easy, 48, 49, 51, 52, 53, 54, and 55 are the years in which there are the, uh, less than 100,000 cases of whooping cough. So something definitely changed around here that allowed us to have fewer cases. All right, maybe some different medicines came into play. Hard to say, but that's what's there. Part C says, based on this data, 
would you expect 1956 to have closer to 50,000 or 100,000? So 56, that's our next number, right? Our next year. Do you think this number would be up to 100,000 or closer to 50,000? Based upon how things are decreasing, decreasing, we only jumped up to 100 one time in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years. I'm gonna go with probably closer to 50,000 because everything seems to be on the decline. So that would make the most sense to me based upon what I'm seeing in that table. Okay, hopefully you agree with that one as well. Number two, in volleyball statistics, a block is recorded when a player deflects the ball hit from the opposing team. Additionally, scorekeepers often keep track of the average number of blocks a player records in a game. Here is part of a table that records the number of blocks and blocks per game for each player in a women's volleyball tournament. Scatter plot that goes along with the table follows. So you can see 13 blocks averaged out to 1.18 a game. So here's the 13 blocks is right about here, 13, and 1.18 is right about there. Here's someone with one block, so one block is going to be somewhere down here, and they average out to 0 0.17. People with no blocks are 0 and 0. Here's a five block person, which is somewhere about here, and 0.42, so it's probably that guy there or gal, and then seven is right about here with 0.64, right about there. So there's some extra data in this scatter plot as well. It says label the axes of the scatter plot with the necessary information. So what do these values represent here from zero to 30? That's gonna represent what we can tell our blocks. And then what does this represent here? This represent our blocks per game. And so you can see how the data from the table is transferred to the scatter plot there. Number three, a cylinder has a radius of four centimeters and a height of five centimeters. So here's our cylinder. And we have a radius of four and a height of five. What's the volume of the cylinder? Well, the cylinder volume is pi r squared h. So we would do pi times 4 squared times the height, which is 5. 4 squared is 16, and 16 times 5 is 80. So the volume of the cylinder is 80 pi. If we, uh, if the radius is tripled, well, the radius is 4, so 4 times 3 is 12. So the radius is tripled. What's going to happen to our volume? Well, then 12 gets squared times 5 times pi and so we have 144 times 5 times pi which is going to equal in this case here 120 uh, sorry 720 pi centimeters cubed so what's happening to our to our radius it's going to be increasing as well to 720 from 80 to 720 so it's not being times uh, tripled it's like uh, well yeah so, because we're doing 80, it's not 80 times three, uh, but it's more like 80 times nine, right? So it's multiplied everything by nine, and that's because we are squaring the three. All right, what about when you half it? When we half it, we take the four, and we divide by two, and we look at two. So we do two squared times five times pi. So that becomes 20 pi, and so we are decreasing it as well to that value right there. So this one is kind of times nine, and this one is not even just half as much. It's more than that, going from 80 to 20. We're talking about it being about a fourth as much. So it's one fourth as much there. So, oops, ran out of space, sorry about that. That's it for today. Have a great day, and we will see you next time.